second letter to the Corinthians, and we come this evening to the twelfth chapter. Let us read together in the Word of God from Second Corinthians chapter 12 and the first verse. And he goes on with this theme of boasting. He says, I must boast, but there is nothing to be gained by it. But I will go on now, he says, to visions and to revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, of course, he's now speaking about himself in an oblique way, uh, just as John calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, a roundabout way. So Paul now describes himself as a man in Christ who 14 years ago, and this is not his conversion experience, which would have happened 20 years before this. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, uh, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know whether the man was still alive or not. God knows. And I know that this man, it's himself of course, was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard many things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though, if I wish to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I shall be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. And the Lord will add a blessing to the reading of his word. To his name be the honor and the praise. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is uh, of uh, some importance because it tells us <clears throat> of Paul's famous experience of being caught up into the third heaven, and he calls it uh, paradise, and also because this is the classical passage in Scripture dealing with the whole subject of glorying in our weaknesses. You may recall that this broad section of 2 Corinthians is very much taken up with the theme of glorying in and boasting of. And what had happened was this. There had arisen in Corinth a group of men who set themselves up in opposition to Paul. They called themselves apostles. Uh, but Paul had other ideas about them. In uh, chapter 11, the previous chapter, verse 5, he speaks rather ironically and dryly 
about, uh, quote, these superlative apostles. Uh, Later on in that same chapter 11, he refers to their boasted mission in verse 12. The superlative apostles with their boasted mission. And in verse 13, he comes right out into the open And he describes these men as false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And so these uh, Johnny-come-latelys had risen in the church in Corinth, and they were boasting of all the natural things that men do boast of. They boasted of and they gloried in their intellectual prowess, their spiritual ancestry, their Greek oratory, their speech, their apostolic authority, what Paul calls glorying in the flesh, being proud of self. And Paul's reply to all of this glorying and boasting is to take up the methods used by these men and to boast himself. And he boasts of three things. First of all, he boasts of outward circumstances, the things that had happened to him for following Jesus all the way, the cost of discipleship. And you read of this, as we studied it last week, in the long catalogue of suffering at the end of uh, chapter 11. Labors, beatings, imprisonments, scourged five times, beaten with Roman rods three times, stoned by the mob once, three times shipwrecked, and so on. What we would call the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, but what Paul acknowledged as the price that had to be paid for being a living Christian in an alien world, a world that knew not when he came, even God's eternal Son. First of all, then, Paul boasted in outward circumstances the price he had paid, the cost of following the Lamb. Now in chapter 12, he adds to this boast. And he boasts of two things now. First of all, he boasts in visions and uh, revelations. I must boast, there's nothing to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. And uh, the difference between visions and revelations is this, that in a vision, something is seen. Ezekiel had visions of the reconstructed temple. John had visions of the new Jerusalem. Stephen had a vision of the risen Christ standing at the Father's hand, waiting to receive him after a martyr's death. In a vision, something is seen, and the message comes from what is seen. But in a revelation... A message is imparted without a picture. For example, you may read the Bible and find that God is speaking to you. God reveals himself and his truth to you. Now that is an authentic revelation and it does not involve ecstasies or charismatic experiences. You can have a revelation without having a vision. And what had happened was this. Fourteen years before this, Paul had had visions 
and revelations. And he had been caught up into the third heaven, which he calls paradise. Now, it was believed by the Jews of that day that there were seven heavens. Of course, the one at the very top was the heaven of heavens, the most heavenly place of all, and that was the home of God. And hence, of course, the phrase, to be in the seventh heaven, an expression of delight and joy, the seventh heaven. But Paul says he was in the third heaven, which is paradise. Now, of course, here's an intriguing question. Jesus himself spoke of paradise to the penitent thief hanging on the cross in those immemorial and wonderful words, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Was that the third heaven? And many Christians also believe that the expression Abraham's bosom is another name for this place a sort of intermediate place after death where the souls of the righteous live in full fruition and the full enjoyment of Christ waiting for the resurrection of their bodies, waiting for the day of Christ and the resurrection so that their bodies and souls will be joined together And they can go home to heaven as whole men and whole women. You remember that the poor man Lazarus, who sat at the gate of the rich man, went to Abraham's bosom. While Dives, the rich man, went to hell. Not Gehenna, the place of burning, but to Hades. Is that the third heaven that Lazarus is in? Is that paradise? And from Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, uh, John tells us that those who live conquering lives in this world, overcoming Christian lives, also go to paradise and they eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Is that the third heaven? Well, if the paradise of 2 Corinthians 12, into which Paul was caught, is the same as the paradise promised by Jesus on the cross to the thief, and is the same as the paradise promised to the martyrs and the conquerors in Revelation chapter 2, and I don't honestly see why the paradises should be different, then what had happened was this. Paul had been caught up by the Spirit. Actually, the Greek word is raptured. He had been raptured by the Spirit into communion with saints and martyrs who had died in Christ. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all there. Ruth, David, Solomon, Stephen, John the Baptist. My friends, what a galaxy. What a party. raptured into paradise. And so it is marvelously fascinating that in spite of all of this, in which many a man would boast for a lifetime, Paul has a lowish view of all these experiences. In fact, he says in verse 1 that there's nothing to be gained by speaking about them. I must boast there is nothing to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. In verse 4, 
he even tells us that what he learned there in the third heaven was so private that it was not for anyone else. And he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. What he learned there was not for you, not for me, wasn't for the church. Excuse me, it was for his eyes only. And that's why he has a a low view of special ecstatic revelations and experiences. Uh, And uh, as a matter of fact, there's a very good reason why the Bible on the whole has a low view of ecstasies and super sensational experiences. Uh, This is the reason that there's no way of checking it. There's no way of checking a man's experience if he's had an ecstasy. For example, supposing you tell me that it has been revealed to you very specially that the world is going to end next Saturday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There's no way of checking that. It may be true or it may be untrue. The only thing you can do is sit and wait till 3 o'clock next Saturday afternoon. And if it doesn't happen, then the revelation was false. And the experience you had, whatever sort of experience it was, was a spurious experience. There certainly are tests in the Bible for people who have visions and revelations. If you care to turn up Deuteronomy chapter 13, there were tests for ecstatic prophets in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 13. The early prophets in Israel, incidentally, (coughs) tended to be a bit Pentecostal. We would call them Pentecostals nowadays. Remember, Saul met them and finished up dancing about the streets with flutes and bands and tambourines and so on. And I've heard it said that it was Samuel's great failure as a leader and a judge in Israel that he didn't really discipline these chaps. Well, be that as it may, there are tests for prophecy. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 1. If a prophet arises among you, or a dreamer of dreams. Now, this is a visionary man who has visions and revelations and gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or wonder which he tells you comes to pass so that he sounds authentic. And if he then says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. Now you know there's something wrong. He's had a vision and an ecstasy, but he's telling you to abandon the living God. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or to that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave to him. In uh, chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, there are more stringent tests for a man who claims to have visions and ecstasies. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 20. The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, it's a spurious experience, or who speaks in the name of other gods, 
seducing men from the living God, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Here's the test. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Now I think this needs to be said. In our age, when there is almost a fashion in extraordinary experiences in some Christian circles, very often associated with the charismatic movement or the neo-Pentecostal movement, if a man has a vision, it must correspond to reality. For example, supposing you tell me that you've had a vision of angels and the archangel Gabriel has said to you that you are going to write a new book for the Bible. That must be wrong. Because it doesn't correspond with reality. The church has decreed for 1,900 years that the canon of Scripture is closed. You cannot subtract from this book. You cannot add to this book the full complement of what God has to say is here. The canon of Scripture is closed. And this is the way in which God reveals himself to men now. When God wants to tell you something, when God wants to show you what he wants you to do or believe, he does it through the Spirit, through the Word. That's how God speaks to men now. Since the church decreed that the Scripture was closed, the books of Scripture, the canon is closed. That's how God speaks to you. Through the Spirit, through the Word. And if a vision that you have contradicts the Word, it's wrong. And if revelations and prophecies and visions and ecstasies contradict the Scriptures, then they're wrong. Paul says that he's going to boast of visions and revelations, but not very much, because his last boast is the main one. He boasts and he glories in his weakness. In chapter 12, he says, Three times I besought the Lord about this, verse 8, to take the thorn in the flesh away, that it should leave me. But God said to me, No, I will not take that horrid thing away. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, of course, no one knows what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Uh, some have suggested it was malaria that he had picked up on his missionary journeys in the marshes and the swamps of Asia Minor. Malaria. Uh, some have suggested, I think to some point, that uh, Paul suffered from bad eyesight. Uh, certainly he refers to eyesight uh, twice in the letter to the Galatians. And it's often suggested that Paul had had such a blinding experience of Christ on the Damascus road that his eyes were damaged by the glory of Christ. And that was a weakness and a thorn in the flesh that he carried 
for the rest of his life. If you care to turn over to Galatians chapter 4, you'll see the grounds for this. Galatians chapter 4. And verse 13, when he first went to Galatia, he says, You know, it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. Now, we don't know what that was. Perhaps it was malaria, a bodily ailment, that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, whatever kind of illness that could have been, you did not scorn or despise me. But you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus, they accepted him, as if he were the Lord himself. What has become of the satisfaction you felt? Now look at this. For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Why does he say that? You would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Were his eyes damaged? Uh, turn over to uh, chapter 6 and verse 11. <clears throat> now you know that Paul normally wrote with an, an amanuensis, a secretary, and just signed a little bit at the end of his letters. And so here he is tagging on the end of the letter to the Galatians. Chapter 6 and verse 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you. Why does he have to do that? Bad eyes? That he has to write with big letters? See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that would compel you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Well, whatever the thorn was, God's failure to remove it is something that lies at the very heart of the gospel message. Now, I want you to take this in tonight if you've taken in nothing else, that the heart of the gospel message is that God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. He doesn't always take away thorns in the flesh. Uh, I think of a young chap who went into the ministry from Port Soy, oh, I think two or three years ahead of me, James Rennie, son of the local Bobby. And he was the most hopeless stammerer that I ever knew. It was impossible to have a conversation with him. And people thought he was crazy. But he won through. And God's strength was made perfect in that particular form of weakness. I am also thinking of uh, a girl I once met. She had been born with serious palate defects. And her speaking was awful. You just couldn't make out a word she was saying. Well, she went through seven operations on her palate. And tonight, she's a missionary in South America speaking Spanish. Weakness has never been a handicap to God. Weakness has never been a hindrance to God. Because it is through weakness that God works. Weakness is the lever. It's the fulcrum by which God works. Let me ask you a question. What do you do with your weaknesses. I'm assuming you have some insight as to what makes you tick. Do you understand your own psychology? Do you know what makes you tick as a person? Why you do the things you do? 
and why there are some things that you don't do. Can you understand your own psychology? What do you do with your weaknesses? Well, there are only two things you can do with a weakness. One is to use it to manipulate people and plead pathos. Poor me. Oh, I'm too shy. I could never do that. No, no. It's my nerves. I'm too nervous. I'm too timid. I could never do that. I, I could never speak. Poor me. Do you know what poor me does? It leaves ego on the throne of your heart. And it'll turn into a monster or a demon. It'll devour you. Your weaknesses, if you use them to manipulate people and plead pathos and poor me, they'll turn into monsters and destroy you. You'll finish up a poor soul. The other thing you can do with your weakness is to hand it over to God to be blessed by Him and to be used by Him as an instrument of His power. Here's how it's done. Find your weakest point you know your weakest point? I know my weakest point. Absolutely your weakest point. Now grasp it. And in the other hand, grasp the sufficiency of God's grace. And then bring them together. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And the whole point of the exercise is this, Paul says, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's a pity, you know, that the translation doesn't bring out the Greek here. Because the Greek is very beautiful. He says, Paul wants these things to be so in order that the power of Christ may pitch its tent upon me or may tabernacle with me. That's the Greek. That's the end. That the power of Christ in your weakness with the sufficiency of God's grace, that the power of Christ may tabernacle with you. Doesn't that thrill you? It thrills me. It warms my heart that where I am weakest, there I am strongest through the sufficiency of God's grace. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to his own holy word.